Well, I'm turning this evening to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou, Adam? My friends, we're looking at this particular statement and the call of God to Adam, Where art thou? And I want to begin by perhaps reminding you, if you don't, of a game. Perhaps you remember when you were younger. Uh, I'm sure all of us have played this game. Perhaps you still play it now uh, with your children or with your grandchildren. Or you know the game, hide and seek. And uh, perhaps uh, you remember how to play it. It's so very easy. I think some of our friends were playing it uh, today with the children in the garden. You know how it goes. You close, somebody has to close their eyes and count to ten and off go the children uh, into different hiding places. Let's say for instance they're uh, uh, in, in the garden and they're trying to hide uh, from you. And one little girl, well she hides behind a very thin tree and uh, because of her size she thinks no one, uh, or because of her size it's so obvious to see where she's, where she's hiding, but she thinks you can't see her. And there's another little girl, or a little boy, shall we say this time, and this little boy, well, he just closes his eyes. And he thinks because he can't see you, you can't see him. And that's his way of hiding. Well, we play along, isn't it, with the children, and we are playing this game with them. But here we see Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, were hiding from God. They weren't playing a game. They were really hiding uh, from the Lord. Hiding in His garden. Why were they hiding from God? Why were they hiding from their Maker? Well, because they just disobeyed Him. They just broken His commandment. And guilt had crept into their souls. Some That feeling they'd never ever known before. That horrible feeling of uh, guilt. Well, crept into their conscience and they, uh, they felt ashamed and embarrassed because of what they had done. And so they, when God came looking for them, they thought they could hide from God. He won't see us. They hid behind the trees, they hid behind the bushes, and they thought they could escape from God's sight. Well, we are like that, friends, isn't it? We are like that. We are living in God's garden. The whole world, we could say, is God's garden. It all belongs to Him. It's all the work of His hands, His creation. We are living in God's world. It's not our own world. But we think we can hide behind the bushes. We think we can hide from God behind the trees. That He won't see us. We can hide in some secure place. And we tend to hide behind all sorts of things. Perhaps it's ideas that we hide behind, or different ideologies that become uh, that are, are, are ex- and excuses are things that we the trees that we hide behind, and all the time we're thinking because we're hiding behind what we believe and what we hold on to uh, that uh, God cannot find us, God, God cannot see us. Maybe some of us we even like that little child. Even we close our eyes uh, spiritually and we think, well, if I just close my eyes and say there is no God, then He's not really there. But He is. He is there. How foolish we are, isn't it? To think that we can just come up, just by closing our eyes, as it were, imagine that there is no Creator. Well, this is God's garden, friend. And God is amazing. God is not like us. He is so far above us. Oh, friends, God is, has this amazing, this astounding ability as God to be present everywhere. He is present at this moment in time, not only here in, with us in this place, every single place in the world, every single place in the universe, His presence is there. It's impossible to run from God. And He sees everyone And he knows everyone. And he sees every thought that a person is thinking in their heart. Every single person in the world. He can see it in one moment of time. And he sees what people are doing. 
And he sees well, the, the motivations of people's hearts. He hears every word. He, he can grasp. He has this amazing ability uh, to grasp every single thing that is happening. We can only single task. I'm not really a big believer in multitasking. But we can maybe do two or three things on the go. But God can do all, all things. There's nothing. It's infinite what he can do. His capacity. Because he is God. He is wonderful. He is marvelous. And in a moment of time, he can see everyone. So none can hide from him. It's ridiculous to think that we can hide from God. Almost as ridiculous you know, as these joyriders. You know how these joyriders, they steal these uh, nice, fast, pacey cars or bikes, whatever. You know, and uh, part of that thrill is being chased by the police uh, up one street and down one street and r across the roundabouts and so on. And there comes a moment in time where they think, well, we've had enough. The police are getting too close. And they ditch the car and they're out, uh, out of the, the, the doors and they're running for their life. They say it's dark when they do these things. And they think, oh, there's no chance of us being caught. And they jump over one fence, and then they jump over another fence, and they jump over another fence, and then they hide behind a shed. And they think, well, no one's going to find me. It's dark, and I've escaped from the, the clutches of the police. But up above, <laughs> up above is a helicopter. It's a police helicopter with thermal imaging up in it. And it can see, uh, the heat sensors can see so very easily where those people are. And the people realize there's a helicopter and they start running. How foolish. The helicopter's above. It's got a bird's eye view of where those people are. And they can see exactly where they're running to. And the word is passed on, of course, to the police. And their fiends are so easily caught. Friends, God can see us. God has a bird's eye view of us wherever we are. You can't hide from him. He can see us and see us so very easily. Oh, Adam and Eve, well, they were hiding uh, from God, hiding behind these trees and the bushes. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And we read, Adam and his wife hid themselves from that presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. God was coming to fellowship with them. Oh, let's go back just a short while. Let's go back a few days in the garden and see how different it was then. Because God often came looking for fellowship with Adam and with Eve. God often came, it's thought perhaps in the, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, came in a, some human form, pre-incarnate, to fellowship with Adam and with Eve. And let's go back and, and see what the picture was like then, so very different to now. Because back then, well, just a few days ago, maybe just even a day ago, let's go back. Because there, when the Lord came uh, looking, well, Adam ran out to meet the Lord. Adam went out with a big smile on his face and his heart leaping with joy that he's, he's coming to fellowship and to uh, commune with his God and his maker. It was a, chart, a time of great delight. Perhaps as we could say, it's like a young bride uh, and her husband comes back home and she's, she's happy that he's home and she rushes to the door. She knows it's him. She rushes to the door to meet him, to greet him, to kiss him, to welcome him home. Because she loves him so much and she loves his presence and she's so happy that he's there. That's what it was like a little bit for Adam, probably even more than that. But there was a joy bounding in his heart, a delight to be uh, with, his, with his God. But not now, not this time. Now there's a reluctance in his heart. Now he is averse uh, to this God. The same God, only yesterday, well, he delighted to, to see. Now something's happened. Now something's happened to him, and he's not the same. He's changed. His demeanor is, is not the same. There's no, no, no smile on his face when the Lord God calls out to him and says, Where are you, Adam? He's hiding from this God, this one who he professed to love so much and who loved him so much. What's happened, Adam? 
What's happened to you? The beautiful, harmonious relationship between you and your God is broken. Well, what's happened, friends? Sin has entered. Sin has spoiled that relationship. Sin, Adam's disobedience to God, has created that rift between him and his maker. And already he's beginning to feel it right from the word go. He begins to feel that he is separated from God and he's begun to look on, the, on God now in a different way and to feel differently about him. He no longer is so, may I use the word, attracted to God as he was before. He's different. Now he's got a feeling he's of guilt and shame and condemnation. But perhaps most of all is this sense of his averseness to his best friend. Adam, what's happened to you? You are, you are so changed. He's different now to his God. Now he no longer wants to speak to, uh, to, to God. Now he's become afraid of God. Now he's become afraid and he's trying to hide uh, from, from him. Oh friends, this is our problem. This is man's problem today. This is why people don't come to God. It's because in their hearts and in their minds there is an averseness to God. They don't want God. There's a repugnance for God, especially when they know that He is holy. Especially when they know that He is pure. There's an unfriendly attitude towards Him. A hostile attitude also. I want nothing to do with God. I want to keep my distance from Him. I prefer it if God just left me alone. That's all I want to do. Just let me, leave me alone to live my life as, it, as, it, as I choose to do. I don't want God coming and knocking at the door of my heart. I've got the signs out on, on my door saying, God, keep away. God, keep out. That's what averseness leads to. I've got, don't post the, through the letterbox of my life, invitations, gospel invitations to come to you. I don't want that from him. I'm happy to keep at a distance. Lord, you keep to your side and I'll keep to mine. Averseness, friends, to God. Or will God leave us alone? He won't. <laughs> God came calling for Adam. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Oh, friends, it's a personal call to, uh, to Adam. He knows, of course, Adam by name, but he knows us all by name. Uh, Adam, where are you? Of course, God knew exactly where he was. Then why did he call out to him? He wants Adam to hear his voice. He wants Adam to know that he is calling him back to himself. He calls because he wants Adam to respond. He calls because, uh, and asks him, Adam, come out wherever you are. Show yourself because he wants to come and meet with him. And whatever has happened and whatever is the issue and the problem, it can be sorted out. It can be dealt with. It's, but it's a personal call. Adam, where are you? Well, friends, God is calling you. Forget for a moment the other people in your life. Forget for a moment the other people in the church here. Just think about yourself. Think about you. You can insert your name in there and, and say, well, John, John, God, uh, uh, where, are, where are you? Jane, where are you? You can put your own name in there. But hear God's voice, because it's like that. That's how God speaks. He doesn't speak en masse to everyone. He comes and speaks to us individually. He calls you. Can you hear? Friends, can you hear His voice? He calls you through the preaching of the Word, the Gospel. He calls you maybe through a Christian friend. He calls you through a Christian family member. Come to Him. Perhaps if we don't listen, he has to call us through a crisis. And he has to send a crisis and trouble into our life. Because only then will we pray and call out to him. Come. Oh, that's a nice word, isn't it? 
That's such a warm, welcoming word. Come out to me, Adam. It's a call, can you see? Come back into a relationship with me. I know it's as if God is saying, I know you have broken the, the, the relationship, but come back into a good relationship with me. Let there be no breach between us. Let us be reconciled. Oh, it's a, a precious call. Well, friends, where are you? Where art thou? The Lord said to Adam. And where are you? Are you hiding as well? What bush are you hiding behind? Well, perhaps it's the bush or the tree of pseudoscience, <laughs> of the science of the world. Are you one of those friends who, when asked if you believe in God, well, your quick response is, well, I believe in science. I believe in evolution. Oh, is that your religion? <laughs> is that your, your faith? I believe in science. Well, friends, perhaps you thought you found a very secure hiding spot behind pseudoscience, and please pay attention to why I say pseudoscience. Perhaps you think uh, uh, man is so very great now, and so much better and capable, and he knows better than God. That would be trusting in the wisdom of men. Is this where you are? You're going to put your whole faith and the, your eternal destiny in the hands of men and, and, and hide behind this bush to say, well, I don't want to meet with God and confront with God. I'm quite happy to stay behind pseudoscience and all that it teaches. This is the explanation for life. There is no God who is calling me, pseudoscience tells you. There's no God who is calling you. It's all uh, a made-up story. Really, friends? Oh, do, friends who are hiding behind this bush, well, you are deliberately closing your eyes to the wonderful order, the amazing design that is in our created world. So much, you cannot, uh, you cannot deny it. There's such amazing brilliance be, behind the created world that we live in. And all of them are pointing in one direction. There must be somebody who has designed all these things. It cannot have happened by chance. Somebody who is infinitely great in power to do, put this world and universe into place. Somebody who is infinitely, immensely wise to put at the order that we see uh, around us. Oh, we could spend the whole day talking about different things, but just think about the human eye. Think about the human eye, just for a moment. Did you know in the human eye there are 125 million cells which just are there to help you to see in dim light? 125 million cells. And then there are another 6 to 7 million cells that are essential to help us to see images accurately and to see color in a, in a clear way. Amazing, in just one eye. We have so many millions of cells and there's so much more about the eye. You can talk about the brain. Such complexity, friends. Chance, evolution, highly unlikely. Oh, are you still a believer in evolution? There are so many holes, really, in evolution. The missing link between fish and amphibians is still missing. <laughs> it's still missing. Perhaps you're not hiding behind that bush. Perhaps you're hiding behind another bush, the bush of morality. You don't want to respond when God calls. Well, because now you've got uh, your own religion. You've got your own set of moral codes. This is what my, my code for life. This is what it means to be a good person. It's not God's code. It's your own. And maybe it makes you a better person in the eyes of your neighbor and your friends think you're a lovely person because you've got this set of codes which means you're, you're good and you're kind to other people. But you've got nothing for God. There's no connection for God. There's no seeking to please Him. It's all uh, on a horizontal level. There's nothing vertical there. And you've got your list, perhaps, of do's and don'ts. This is my code for life. And you're hiding behind this particular bush, which says, well, I don't need conversion. I don't need a change of heart. I don't need a personal relationship with God. I can do it. 
I'm okay as I am. I'm good enough as I am. You're hiding from God, friends. You're hiding behind your own morality. Your own morality. Well, let's talk about that. Where are you morally? Where are you morally, friends? What are you really like? Think about that. What are you really like? I'm not talking about when you're with, with other people. But where are you? What goes on within you? Uh, be honest with yourself. Don't you find that thoughts of envy and jealousy are eating away at you at times and you can't control it? And it's corrupting and it's destroying you at times and you feel the power of it and you wish you could get rid of it, but you can't. And perhaps you feel also uh, uh, those thoughts that often cross your mind, I'm better than her, I'm better than him, I'm much, I'm, I'm much more able and capable than they are. Or perhaps impure imaginations. How many, friends, how many impure thoughts have filled our minds? Or anger. How many times have we in anger hurt those who we love? Hurt them by unkind words. How about selfishness? Where are we? Are we really so selfless people? Are we not really those who live for number one, for me, for my family? That's what counts. Where are we, friends, morally? But then, let's think of just one more a bush, one more hiding place. And let me seek to expose the bush of fear. Adam here was hiding because he was afraid. In verse 10, he the Lord, when the Lord said, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Adam was hiding because he was afraid. He was afraid because he was naked, because he was guilty, because of his sin. He had done wrong, and now he's afraid of exposure before God, a holy God, and he's afraid of that when he... If he does show himself, well, God is going to punish me. God is going to punish me for my sins. And he had perhaps these thoughts, I don't want to meet with God. I'm afraid of being punished. Just like children sometimes often, uh, when, if they know they're going to be punished, they will try and lock themselves in the room or hide away so somewhere. Oh, we're like that as well, as adults. But we, we don't, we, there are people who, are, who perhaps they want to come to God. Perhaps in their, they know that they are sinners, they know they've done wrong, but they're afraid uh, that if they come to God, he's got, because He is holy, He's going to punish me. Oh, friends, this is a gracious call from God. When God comes looking uh, for us and He says to us individually, where are you? It's also a, a call, a gracious call. Yes, it's a call for our accountability. Yes, we must tell the Lord what we have done. Yes, we must come confessing our sins to Him. But at the very same time, behind this call is God seeking to forgive us if we will only come out. Adam, if you will only come out. And He did. And you see how the Lord dealt with him, how the Lord brought him to confess his sin, to admit what he had done. And then the Lord, in verse 15, we read, uh, of how the promised seed, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a reference to, who will come in the future to take away our sins. Forgiveness was granted to him right there in the garden. But that's often this fear, perhaps, of God because of his holiness, and we, are, we don't want to come to him. So when he calls, we hold back. And we, uh, the Lord comes. We don't know what kind of a reception we're going to receive from Him. We're afraid that He's going to deal harshly with us. It's not so, friends. It's not so. If we come out into the open before Him, and we come out admitting and confessing our sin to Him, He it will not condemn us, but He will uh, forgive us and pardon us. Yes, we deserve to be condemned. Yes, we deserve that we are interrogated as He does. And yes, we deserve to be punished for our sins. But He also intends our forgiveness. He has good intentions towards us. 
and He wants to pardon us and forgive us and heal the rift that is between us and to restore that broken relationship. Oh, friends, that's why Christ came. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, left heaven and came into this world and lived as a man amongst us, lived in poverty, and He submitted Himself to the cross and to uh, persecution and to suffering and shame on the cross. Why? Because there on the cross, He was bearing away the sins and the penalty of all who will trust in Him, in His name. That's what God was, Christ was doing, reconciling man to His Maker, to God. There's only, that's the only way that we can. It's only through the cross that we can. But we must come out into the open, friends. We, cannot, we mustn't hide uh, from God. We must come clean before Him. Hear the words of God again in the book of Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, He says. Though your sins be red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Let's reconcile, the Lord says. Let there be no breach between us. Come out, tell me everything. Tell me what you have done. Be honest about it. Hold nothing back. Come clean. Did you do the things that I told you not to do? Oh, confess it to Him. Confess your sins. Admit your guilt. And He will hear what you say. Ask Him to forgive you. And He will. Ask Christ to cleanse you through His shed blood. Tell the Lord, Lord, I believe in You. Lord, take me back. Reconcile me with my God. Bring me back into a good relationship with You so that I'm no longer hiding from You, but happy to be in relationship with You again. Oh, will He do it? Will He do it? Of course He will. He will definitely welcome you back. Let me close by just giving you, uh, telling you a story of a, a true story, and this is of a lady, and she was a Christian worker, and uh, she was working in Edinburgh a while ago, this is, and uh, this Christian lady, she came across an, a young lady, a very young lady, and this a young lady sadly had given herself over to prostitution. We don't know why, but she had, and uh, this Christian lady, she just begged this young girl, go home. Go home, return home. And the, the girl thought, said, no, my parents won't uh, receive me if I go home. Well, the Christian woman, she took it upon herself to write to this young girl's mum and to tell her, I've met your daughter. She's very sorry for the way that she's lived her life and she wants to return home, but she's reluctant to do so. The ne very next post, uh, brought an answer back, and on the very envelope it said, immediately, immediately. And then they opened the envelope, and uh, there the mother had written, uh, forgiven, I forgive her everything, I just want her back. And she even sent money for her to um, uh, take the, the trip, the transport back. And the final two words at the bottom, you know what it was? Come immediately. Come immediately. She wanted her daughter back. So does the Lord, friends. Do you doubt? Come out from that bush. Come out from that hiding place. Hear uh, what the Lord says. Come immediately to Him. Don't delay. He's willing to pardon you. He's willing to give you new life. He's willing to save you and make you a better person, to take you at last to heaven. If only you will come out. But if you keep hiding, it'll never happen to you. You'll forever be distant from God in this life and in the next. Come, friends. Come immediately to Him. Delay no longer. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, how we thank You and praise You from our hearts that You came looking for us and questioning us, and seeking us, and bringing us to accountability, and bringing us to confess our sins, and bringing us out from those hiding places of our lives. Oh Lord, bring us all out tonight, we pray, if we haven't done so, and grant that we may find 
the joy of forgiveness and the joy of being in a right relationship with you and knowing you, the great and the mighty and glorious God and Jesus Christ, your Son. Bless us all in these things, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's close by singing our final hymn, number 417. O Lord, from whom there's naught concealed. 417.